Howdy. This video is on the rate constant and the Arrhenius equation. The rate constant is part of the rate equation and greatly affects the reaction rates. By understanding what affects rate constants, we can better understand reactions. The Arrhenius equation is used to calculate the rate constant and illustrates how the rate constant is affected by temperature and the presence of a catalyst. After watching this video, you should be able to understand the following terms, reaction coordinate, activation energy, transition state. You should understand how the rate constant and the rate of reaction are affected by temperature and the presence of catalyst. You should understand that a catalyst is not consumed by a reaction, it just provides an alternate pathway that has a lower activation energy. And so you can imagine this being the reaction profile for a reaction. The y-axis is your energy, and so here's your reactants, here's your products. And so the time it takes for this process to occur depends on how high the difference between the top and where the reactants are. The bigger this distance, the slower the reaction. This is analogous to the activation energy. So the rate of reaction is dependent on how big the activation energy is. When a fluoride ion approaches a methyl chloride molecule, a bond begins to form between the fluoride and the carbon. The molecule's carbon-chlorine bond lengthens and becomes weaker the energy of the system increases. As the carbon-fluoride bond forms and the carbon-chlorine breaks, a configuration of maximum energy is reached, called the transition state. As the reaction proceeds to completion, the energy of the system decreases. This is kind of cool. Again, the y-axis is energy. On the x-axis, we have reaction progress. And so here's your reactants, here's your products. Now it's kind of cool, if you look at it, here's your transition state. So this is the highest energy point. And notice that in this case, it corresponds to carbon surrounded by five different atoms. Now we know that's not stable. Transition states are not stable, but they're basically the barrier that the reaction has to overcome to occur. And so again, we have reactions, products, and the transition state, the, this is the reaction profile. The activation energy is a difference energy between the transition state, the un unstable state, and the reactants. And so to a great extent, this dictates the speed of the reaction. The difference in potential energy of products and reactants, this dictates the equilibrium constant. So remember, delta G naught equals minus RT natural log K. And so these two things are, are, are a bit separate. This is how fast the reaction goes, and this dictates um, if you're gonna have more products at equilibrium or you're gonna have more reactants at equilibrium. And so when we're talking about equilibrium, we use this plot. We had energy versus reaction quotient, and the minimum tells us that's where equilibrium occurs. Most systems tend towards the lowest energy, and that's what we're seeing here. Now this plot's a little bit different. We have energy still on the y-axis, but here we have reaction quotient, and so we have only reactants, only products, and the transition state. And so between these two plots, the y-axis is different. Here the reaction coordinate, how the reaction is occurring. Here the reaction quotient, we're looking at um, the ratio of products over reactants. And so delta G naught equals delta G products minus reactants. And so here our products are lower energy. And so we should have mostly products at equilibrium and our K would be greater than one. Here delta G naught is greater than zero. So that means the reactants are lower energy. At equilibrium we should have mostly reactants. And so K would be less than one. Between these two, this one has a higher activation energy, and so that's going to have a slower reaction. Typically, the smaller the activation energy, the faster the reaction. And so, in general, difference in activation energy is why some reactions are fast and some reactions are slow. The higher the activation energy, the slower the reaction. The activation energy also causes reactions to go faster at higher temperatures. At higher temperatures, a large portion of the reactants have enough energy to overcome the activation energy. And so if we look at this reaction profile on the left, is its equilibrium constant greater or less than one? And so again, equilibrium constant depends on the difference in energy between products and reactants. Here we see the products are more stable, and so we should have mostly products at equilibrium, and so K should be greater than one, which is larger than the rate constant of the forward reaction or the reversed. And so the, for the forward reaction, this is the activation energy. For the reverse, this is the activation energy. And so the forward reaction has a smaller activation energy so it should have a larger rate constant. For reactions corresponding to the profile shown on the left, which has a larger equilibrium constant, and so the bigger the difference in energy between products and reactants, the bigger the equilibrium constant, and so this one should have a larger equilibrium constant than that one, which has a larger rate constant for the forward reaction that would correspond to the smaller activation energy, and so it'd be the bottom one. Oxygen and methane molecules are mixed together in the same container, they collide.
but there is no reaction until a spark or flame is added. Why? To react, the molecules must collide with sufficient energy to break the oxygen-oxygen bonds and carbon-hydrogen bonds so new bonds can form. The additional energy needed to break existing bonds and start the reaction is called activation energy. An energy diagram can help show these energy changes. Initially, the oxygen and methane molecules collide but do not have sufficient energy to react. A flame can supply the activation energy needed to start the reaction. At this point, bonds break and new bonds form in an exothermic reaction that releases energy. And so here we have methane, which is basically natural gas, plus oxygen going to these products. Now, if it wasn't for the activation energy, we couldn't store fuels, right? If it wasn't for the activation energy, and all fuels would be consumed. But because there's activation energy, we're actually able to store fuels. So fuels like methane do not typically react without a spark or flame because they typically do not have enough energy to overcome the activation barrier. Now, the fuels are less stable than the products of combustion, and so the reaction profile looks something like this. Now, it's kind of interesting. There is something referred to as the auto-ignition temperature. At this temperature, enough of the reactants would have enough energy to overcome the activation barrier that the reaction would be spontaneous. But thankfully, there is this activation energy, so we're actually able to store fuels. And oxygen are continually colliding, but lack sufficient energy to react. Heat from lightning supplies the activation energy to break bonds, and new bonds form in an endothermic reaction that absorbs energy. And so this is an example of an endothermic process. The products are higher energy than the reactants, and you still have this activation energy. So both exothermic reactions and endothermic reactions have activation energies which dictate the speed of the reaction. Now, if we have a catalyst, the catalyst can greatly speed up the reaction because it will provide a pathway to smaller activation energy. And so the black line corresponds to the uncatalyzed reaction. The red line corresponds to the catalyzed reaction. Now notice the catalyst does not change the energy of the products or reactants. So the catalyst will not change the position of equilibrium, but it lowers the activation energy, and so it, the system will get to equilibrium much faster. And again, catalysts are not consumed during the reaction. But again, it's a really important point. Because the catalyst does not change the difference in energy between products or reactants, catalysts do not change the composition of equilibrium. I should also mention that the catalyst changes the activation energy of the forward reaction. It also changes the activation energy of the reverse reaction. So it speeds up both the forward and the reverse reaction. Now this is kind of a cool reaction. So we have hydrogen peroxide going into water and oxygen. And manganese oxide is actually can catalyze this reaction. Now, if you notice, once I start this video, that does not appear to be any reaction. There is a reaction, but it's kind of slow. But once you add the catalyst, the reaction gets much, much faster. Hydrogen peroxide in water decomposes slowly at room temperature. In the presence of manganese dioxide, however, the decomposition occurs much more rapidly. The reaction produces oxygen and water. The manganese dioxide is not consumed or otherwise altered by the reaction. It serves only as a catalyst and makes the reaction occur more rapidly. And so again, catalysts work by lowering that transition state, making the transition state more stable. And so it speeds up both the forward and reverse reaction. Now it's kind of cool. If we filtered this and got the manganese oxide back, we could use it over and over again because again, it's not consumed by the reaction. For cars, there's a catalytic converter, which helps convert carbon monoxide and nitrogen monoxide into carbon dioxide, nitrogen gas, and oxygen gas. A significant source of air pollution in many cities is the emission of nitrogen oxides by gasoline engines. The problem is not as severe as it was a few decades ago, due largely to the advent of devices called catalytic converters installed in automobile exhaust systems. That's really kind of cool if you think about air quality 50 years ago was much worse than air quality currently in the United States because of, in part, catalytic converters. And so the way the catalytic converter works is it provides a place where the reaction occurs, stabilizing the transition state. In a platinum-based catalytic converter, nitrogen monoxide molecules in the exhaust stick to the surface of the platinum. 
the molecule decomposes, each atom remaining on the surface. When another NO molecule comes to the area, it also decomposes, and its N atom bonds with the other N atom on the platinum surface. The O atoms also combine. The gaseous nitrogen and oxygen molecules then float away from the surface. And so again, the catalyst just stabilizes the transition state, reducing the activation energy, speeding up both the forward and the reverse reactions. Another example of catalyst would be um, chlorine. And so CFCs were used as refrigerants when they got into the atmosphere. If they were hit by light, they could actually break the chlorine carbon bond. And then that chlorine atom could actually catalytically destroy the ozone. And so this is the two steps. So the chlorine atom plus ozone forms ClO plus O2. The ClO plus oxygen forms chlorine plus oxygen. And so you notice that the catalyst is there at the beginning. It's there at the end. And so it's not in the net reaction. The ClO is a reaction intermediate. It's made by the reaction and then consumed by the reaction. The stratospheric ozone layer, so important to life on Earth, can be depleted by catalytic chemical processes. In recent years, man-made chemicals have contributed to the loss of stratospheric ozone. Among the most important of these are chlorofluorocarbons, or freons. For example, freon-12. Chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs, are very stable molecules in the lower atmosphere. Over a period of years, they slowly diffuse into the stratosphere. In the stratosphere, the CFCs are subjected to energetic ultraviolet rays that can cause rupture of the carbon-chlorine bond. The chlorine atoms act as a catalyst for the decomposition of ozone. Collision with an ozone molecule results in oxygen transfer, forming ClO and molecular oxygen. The ClO that is formed reacts with various species, notably atomic oxygen, to reform the chlorine atom and producing molecular oxygen. The sequence of reactions consists first of reaction of chlorine atoms with ozone, followed by the reaction of ClO with atomic oxygen. The overall reaction is just the decomposition of ozone. Atomic chlorine acts as a catalyst for the decomposition. Because the presence of CFCs in the stratosphere is capable of substantially reducing the ozone shield on which life depends, their manufacture and use has been greatly curtailed in the industrialized nations. Nevertheless, their effects on the ozone layer will remain for and so it's really kind of cool. The countries came together and decided to ban the production of CFCs. And over time, the ozone holes will actually fix themselves. And so the chlorine is there at the beginning. This is a two-step process. The chlorine, the catalyst, is there at the beginning. It's there at the end. It's not in the net reaction. Reaction intermediates like CLO get produced by the reaction and then get consumed by the reaction. So true or false, a catalyst increases the rate of the forward reaction without affecting the rate of reverse reaction. That would be false. The catalyst increases the rate of both the forward and the reverse reaction. True or false, the catalyst is not consumed during the reaction. That is true. The catalyst is just providing an alternative pathway for the reaction to occur. And in this alternative pathway, the transition state is stabilized. True or false, the more effective the catalyst, the larger the equum constant. False. The catalyst does not affect the energy of the products of the reactants, just of the transition state. True or false, the catalyst changes the reaction pathway of a reaction in such a way that it becomes more exothermic. False, again, catalyst does not affect the energy of the products of reactants, just of the transition state. And so again, notice that the energy of the products of reactants are unchanged. The black line is the uncatalyzed reaction. The red is the catalyzed reaction. And so all a catalyst does is reduce the activation energy of the forward reaction and the reverse reaction, and so it speeds up both. Catalytic converter in cars reduces pollution emitted by cars. Enzyme catalyzed reactions in the body. Chlorine from CFCs catalyze the destruction of ozone. So these are some of the examples of how catalysts work. Now the Arrhenius equation is used to calculate the rate constant, and so lowercase k is the rate constant. It's equal to a, or a frequency factor, times e to the minus ea over rt, where ea is our activation energy, r is the gas constant, and t is temperature in Kelvin. And so the exponent is directly related to the percent of reactants that have enough energy to overcome the activation energy. 
And the A term you can think about in, ter in terms of what percent of collisions have a correct orientation. Notice that the rate constant increases as temperature is raised and decreases as the activation energy is raised. The higher the temperature or the lower the activation energy, the faster the reaction. And so it's kind of interesting for the arranged equation, it doesn't matter what's after the activation energy. So if we're looking at the forward reaction, you know, all that we're looking at is the activation energy and how hard is to overcome that. It doesn't matter if it's exothermic or endothermic reaction. And so the rate of a reaction depends on concentrations, physical state, reactant, temperature, presence of the catalyst. Now the rate constant depends only on the physical state of reactants, temperature, and presence of the catalyst. The concentrations are there explicitly. As the temperature is increased, a higher fraction of molecules will have a kinetic energy that is greater than the activation energy. And so here we have T1, T2, T3. T3 is larger. And so notice as you increase the temperature, you're going to a larger average kinetic energy. You're also getting a broader distribution. And so reaction rates and rate constants are temperature dependent. And so this is the rate constant as a function of temperature. And so notice that it actually increases exponentially. Now if we start with the Arrhenius equation and we take the natural log of both sides, we get this. Now this natural log of A times E to minus A, E A of RT is equal to this. With the natural log, you get rid of the E. And so you end up with the natural log of the rate constant equals natural log of A minus EA over RT. Now you're not responsible for the math, I just want to show you where the equations come from. Now this bottom one is pretty important. It shows you that if you plot the natural log of K as a function of one over T, you'll get a straight line with the slope of minus EA over R. And so this is natural log of K plotted as a function of one over T. And so again, you get a straight line with slope of minus E over R, and that's one way we can actually determine the activation energy for a reaction. And slope is equal to, in this case, minus 12,392. R is 8.345 joules per mole Kelvin, and so we can actually get activation energy as 103 kilojoules per mole. So the diagram below shows the Arrhenius plots for two chemical reactions. Arrhenius plot just means log of K versus one over T. So which reaction has a larger activation energy? And so the one with the more negative slope should have the larger activation energy. And so for bimolecular reactions, you have to have enough energy to overcome the activation energy. You also have to have the correct geometry. For two molecules to react, they must collide. If an ozone molecule and a nitrogen monoxide molecule meet without enough energy to overcome their bond energies, a reaction does not occur and the molecules separate without reacting. Again, the exponent in the Arrhenius equation is directly related to the percent of reactants that have enough energy to overcome the activation energy. And so they need enough energy, they also need to have the correct orientation. If the two molecules collide with sufficient energy to overcome the activation barrier, but with an orientation that does not allow new bonds to form, no reaction takes place. The molecules will separate unreact. And so in terms of the A term, for the radius equation. You can think about it as being related to the percent of collisions that have the correct orientation to occur. For some complex reactions, such as that between potassium atoms and methyl iodide, the relative orientations of the reactions becomes important. Only when the potassium atom collides directly with the iodine atom will the reaction take place. And so to a large extent, the rate of the reaction depends on that activation energy. And we can use the Arrhenius equation to actually calculate the rate constant. And again, the A term corresponds to the percent of collisions at the right orientation if you're thinking about a biomolecular reaction. And again, the exponential term tells you what fraction of the reactants have enough energy to overcome the barrier. Catalysts provide an alternative pathway with a lower activation energy. And so lower activation energy corresponds to a larger K and a faster reaction. And again, please remember the catalyst speeds up both the forward reaction and reverse reaction, does not change the energy of the product reactants. So a catalyst does not change how exothermic or how endothermic reaction is. It does not change the equilibrium constant. I hope that was helpful.